Welcome to Winning with Data Driven Marketing Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Waz.ai Market Research. I'm Julie, your host in this podcast, and in every single episode, we talk to industry leaders, marketers, and growth experts in Asia about how to use data to enhance the ROI in their marketing activities. We bring you real case studies while giving you background on how these leaders build their career to where they are today. So joining me today is the famous Chen Chao, who a lot of people already know about. Uh, he has years and years of experience in bridging the gap between marketing technology and data. So to, thank you for joining us today. Welcome, Chen Chao. Hey, thanks, Julie, and it's my honor to be here. So... Looking through, uh, so I know you for quite a bit, uh, but just for the audience, right, I will sh- share a little bit about Chin Chao. So Chin Chao, you've been in Accenture, then you went to Job Street, and then Groupon. Uh, I think I, I started to hear your name when you were in Groupon, and after that, um, you started your entrepreneurial journey, uh, KFIT, and then Faith. So I'm curious, right, can you take us back to your career starting point and share with us how do you get to where you are today? Was this starting point? You look at education starting point, career starting point? Uh, career starting point. Okay, yeah. So I think when I first graduated, I got a place for master at Stanford. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a scholarship. So that was how I started Accenture. I think con- in consulting, I think that's where I got thrown into different projects and good learning. And I think that in that project as well, I think the people around that, many of my teammates went on to build lots of amazing stuff. Many of them are now CEO or C-levels in many huge companies. So I think that's sort of where that first career built upon. And then I think from there, I went to Job Street. That was my first exposure to product. I had no idea of product when I first got in. Decided that to just to, to take a different leap of faith and went in to pick up. So I think that it's a Job Street was looking at the fresh graduate student segments, understanding the students segments. And I think that over there as well, we use quite a bit of data as well. Still remember back then we were trying to do a job street English language assessment. Basically, at employers, a lot of them have challenges with fresh graduate students, English language command. So created a product, uh, job street English language assessment, a short form JELA. And basically, we enable people to take the test uh, once in every three months. And because to encourage them to put in a lot of data into job street, mm. for every data that you put in, you will know how good you are your English compared to people of the same type. So if you put in that you are economics major, you know how good your English compared to every economics major. If you put that you study a Unisim layer, then you will be compared against everyone in Unisim layer. So everyone will get like five, six, seven data of like, you're better than 88% of students of this, 66% of people of that, right? And and I think that sort of tying in data, gamifications and driving, building on objectives and that built on. And that features that was created is still used today, almost 15 years down the line. Let me use by done by millions of people and maybe affect positively or negatively people's job applications over the years, right? So from there, yeah. uh, after Job Streets uh, went into Groupon. So at that time, job, uh, Joe offered me as an inside sales manager, which is technically a tele sales. But I think that when I Job Street, I was, I was uh, learning that I should learn pick up sales one day. So that was what drives me to take that up, right? Mm-hmm. And fast forward, whereas I gone into job uh, Groupon, like after serving my two-month notice, uh, Joel and team doesn't need any more tele sales already. They couldn't wait for me. They hired other folks to run it. So I was there for three weeks bumming around. And one fine day, Joel basically asked me, why do you become CEO? So that was how I got into CEO. No experience, never managed anyone, thrown in, into there. Build it up from Groupon from the start, from Malaysia, turn around a few of the countries and eventually managing operations for APEC. And I think that the from there, 2015, YOLO moment came and we decided to start our own journey in KFIT. And then from there, got a chance to buy Groupon back. So we bought Groupon in Southeast Asia back and went on to build Faith. And in 2021, we got a chance to be acquired by PyLabs. Can I know what are the top one to three challenges you face when we are trying to grow in the user base or growing the market share? Hmm, good question. Yeah, so I think that Maybe one thing that in the, as we build on faith, right? So I think one of the conscious choice as we go on is back then was we don't want to be an e-wallet. So mm-hmm. until today, a lot of people may not realize that right, we are not an e-wallet. So mm-hmm. and it's a conscious choice because the competitors, if you call them competitors, have 
billions of dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Crap. They they raise maybe 15, 16 billion US dollar total. Yeah. US dollar. Shopee Pay. They have billions. If you look at Maybank, mm-hmm. if you look at Boost, which is owned by Asiata, Touch and Go, which is owned by CIMB Bank and Financial Lazada, right? They all have billions. Connections, connect brands, everything. So if you go hit on, you're asking for trouble. So I think that when we look at growing user base as well, is picking the segment. So I think that one of the challenges is you cannot go mass because you go mass hit on against all these giants, you will get crushed. So how do you play? How do you work with everyone, create values and target a certain segment, right? So if you look at today at Faith, there are two parts, right? I think one is that we are at the malls, mostly at the mid size, two, three outlets to 20, 30 outlets. Generally, those size. For those that have a few hundred outlets, we are mostly not there because we can't compete in that play. For those that is a single stall at the Pasamalam and all those things, we are not there as well, right? Because that market is a different levels of CDs and play. So we find a sweet spot, that's maybe one. Two is working closely with all the players that for most people think that it's competitors, right? Let's say today, whether Boost, Grab Pay, Touch and Goes, Alipay, the likes of Google Pay, Payla, Dash, Singtel Dash, UOB. We are all working partners, right? So, and many more, right? So, for us, instead of saying that, okay, this is our space and we want to do like this, why don't we work with Cross? Like maybe something that people may not realize, right? Today, if you have a Touch and Go app, you found any Faith Pay doing our QR, you can just scan and get all the Faith Pay cashback sitting in your Touch and Go app for all the merchants, right? And if you do the linking account one time, you get it across, right? So that's a simple, and in Singapore, that feature, the same feature was available for Payla, DBS Payla, UOB, Tomorrow app, Singtel Dash, Google Pay, right? So it's integrated building. So think of it like for that case in Singapore, let's say Subway. Today, a customer today can use a DBS Payla to pay and get a cashback for Subway. Tomorrow, they can be able to use a UOB Tomorrow app to redeem that cashback and earn another cashback that the next day they will use a Singtel Dash to redeem. So it all ties back to Subway, but then it's now multi-platforms, right? And that's being built up, right? So I think if you look at it, so I think that if you look at user base as well, traditionally you look at user base is the saying these people need to register in your app. They need to have an account, they need to have honest thing. But today, many of our users are not in Faith app. Many of users are sitting in Touch and Go apps, the Google Pay app, the DBS Payla app, et cetera. And those are our users as well. So I think in the end, it's also looking at how the definition of users, how do you play around and how do you create win-win synergy? So the fundamentals, right? So, so that what is user, right? So I think that's maybe something you look at that what can be done, what can't be done, right? And I think as you build the user as well, it's always knowing the unique economics, right? What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? What sounds cool, but may not make sense, right? So I think it's a lot of it aware of it, right? At what channel? So sometimes you may be able to get a user super cheap, but the lifetime value of that customers could be very low or it may not fit your segment. So a lot of times, sometimes we may be like too zealous to get something and then we found a channel and say, oh, wow, this is super cheap, but then we may not realize that the the customers are actually not aligned to us, right? And of course, sometimes you found the right segment. How do you be able to really, really drive it, right? And also a lot of times is looking at the parts, right? Is that think of like, let's say, let's say you're going to drive user to downloads. Just by, when we're doing performance marketing, just by setting that the downloads happen when people are having Wi-Fi versus 4G or 5G, reduce your cost per acquisition by maybe about 50%. Just a simple tweak like that. Oh, very interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, there's a lot of questions that are really like lined up. Uh, let's go with the first one. I really like how you say it. Um, don't go for the mass and pick the target segments. And eventually, uh, as you, just not as you painted, right? Now, after your plan is all fulfilled, I can see how you are technically capturing a lot of users, even though they are not on your platform. But if we go back to the starting point, um, 
a lot of the uh, I spoke with companies who sometimes just getting started, right? Uh, the question they have is this: How do I pick a segment that is not too broad but not too narrow? How do I know that if the segment I pick will actually give me sufficient market share that I don't leave money on the table at the same time? Because it is easy to look at the mass market and feel like that's the biggest market share. So, what is the technique that you use when picking the target segment? Yeah, I think one is understanding the market dynamics, your unfair advantage. What is the unique about yours, right? So, I think that's maybe one of the things. Let's say for ours, our cashback is always used back at the same merchant. Everyone else is not. Right, so you need to sort of find an angle. So for this, at what segment it works the best? At what segment it may be irrelevant? Right, so so if you think on it, then we also do store value where people can store their value. But Starbucks already got their own store value. People would yep. do it. But if you look at it, the roadside garage, will you store a value hundred ringgit there? You likely would won't. Right, so the super big one donate us to do this because they can they can afford the R and Ds and customization to build it. The super small one doesn't need this. So the sweet spot falls back to the middle, right? So I think a lot of it is finding angles. And sometimes it's at a segment like Starbucks. We didn't we haven't worked with them at a national level, but we just do we do work with them in Johor. Right? We do have a Singaporeans that come over across, which is our base, and it's a segment that is quite enough to play from there. Subway back then we started from Northern before we went nationwide, right? So there is also different segment that we look at it and say, how do we angle it, right? And and sometimes it's that looking at it and saying that, okay, is that sometimes it's a starting point. Sometimes it's that there's an end all for the, for the play, right? And there's no right or wrong as well. How much capital you have, how much resources you have, how much risk you're willing to take. And that's all those things will tie back to answer just on that question, right? On how big is good enough, right? So let's say you have billions and billions sitting there that you can afford to take huge risks on. Yeah, go for big ones, right? If you don't have that, you have a very, very limited, you're bootstrapping, every dollar is super precious, then you have to be in a very narrow and target and then gradually expand. When you expand, let's say when we launch in Penang, we didn't launch in a whole island. We didn't launch in an area. We didn't even launch at a mall. We launched at the LG floor of Gurney Plaza. At that time, maybe 70-80% of restaurants there at the LG floor on us. That was how we launched. When you went into that floor, you feel that it is launched. Right? Because it has the same re- limited resources. If you do statewide, if you do most wider area, you would not be felt. But when you concentrate, you get something. So a lot of time is also that's a play. Of course, you can't be forever there, but that's mm-hmm. the starting point, and then you go. So I think it's pick a starting point that makes sense. Like even when we started Faith in Klang Valley, we started in Telawi in Bangsa, we started in Uptown, and we are, we started Desa Sri Hatabas, focus on FMB. So those were the three areas that we started with, and then we go around across gradually add on right. So so it plays an angle as you build on. So I think the thinking on it, dream big, start small, and then go from there. Mm. I can see uh, from a lot of the points that you mentioned, right? Concentrate, focus, peaking. Uh, I'm curious, is there like, um, that how do, at knowing you, I know, uh, you know, you are a data cruncher. So how do data or research play a role behind all this, uh, finding the right focus? If you can give us a um, a specific example, that would be great as well. Yeah, so let's look at uh, where to start, right? So I think the one is that, so let's say I'm picking where to start. So I think a few things that data that we, external data, right? So I think take one. One is that if you go to like Google Maps and see where the businesses are, so you know there's a certain concentrations of area. You can use some data in terms of how many shops are there in across. Sometimes it's manual, right? You go and look at it, open a directory of the malls and count, right? Sometimes it's more automated. But basically, I think one is a supply. And a lot of time, enough people have done work to determine the demand and supply play. And the second, I think, is observations. Which area feels like there's a concentration? Do you know the market or you don't know the market? 
right? For some of the second tier city, we literally draw a cross and say, this is the center point. How do we draw a line, right? A, a, a circle within there and focus within one km radius, or half km radius from there, right? So, so I think a lot of it is start from a uh, area using summer data, and these are the at the kickstart, right? And then as you build a point, let's say example now is fast forward, you already operate in the whole city. So how we balancing is that we know the supply in every mall. So the thing of it sometimes we do is that you list up all the malls in town. This restaurant, this mall has 344 shops. We are in 68 shops. That's a 20% market share. What is the market share across, right? It by percentage and absolute value. And the second one is the by transactions, right? You do the same thing, right? Actually, you might not have the entire transaction on the mall, but you have the balance, your transactions, right? And then sometimes you do observation. I do walks the malls. One way to get my 10,000 steps. The second way is counting how many people in the shops and take a snapshot across, right? So I think then, and then you balance it up, right? Some malls, the strength is in supply. Gap is in demand. Some malls is the other way around. Supply is a gap. Demand is strong. Right? Some malls is bad in both, right? And some is great in both. I think some of this, so I think as you use data, if you use some data, start from your hypothesis, start from your observations, and then pull through, right? Of course, you might have lots of data to, to look through, like right? I'm a data person, so I look at data every hour and all those kind of things, but you don't want to be sank into that with so much data and you know what to do. You still want to start from a hypothesis. You want to try to find out. You want to find out the supply the problem and demand the problem. You want to find out why people don't transact. Let's say example, you have a bunch of users, why people don't transact. There are many factors that can go in there, right? One, no one land on your app, no one land on your website. Hmm. Two, they land, but they pounce quickly. If your app wise, do they uninstall? Right? How's install uninstallation rate? Email wise, do they unsubscribe? If you do push notification, do they open or don't open or do they block your push? In app, the same thing, right? So then for each of that, if you do emails, then if you open, do they click? After they click to the page, how long they stay? Do they bounce? Do they try to do transactions, but the transaction fails because the OTP doesn't come up because they, their e-wallet ran out of money or because the authorizing just the not go through or they don't even attempt. All right? Like, so if you look at it, there's just a mere point of transaction doesn't happen. Just now in the last two, three minutes, we maybe talk about, about 10 different things that yeah. could have been a problem. Right? Then of each other, you might need to say, okay, you might have suspect that this tree is definitely not the reason. This fall, maybe we need to dive deeper. Then you go with some data to say, okay, this makes sense, not make sense. What is the market expectation? And again, now with all this generative AI, you just go there and ask, her, right? What is the conversion rate of this day, mean or not, right? And I think that today, that sort of connect, right? The And today, of course, yes, there are sometimes the data doesn't work perfectly. I mean, that's true. But I think that a lot of it is, how do you leverage on it? And you will never be perfectly full on with data, but you want to have enough to make decision. And a lot of decisions, you don't need perfect precision. You need good enough judgment to say that this is worth investing into it, or this should be stopped immediately. Right? That's the yeah. good enough for you to know that why is, where should we prioritize or where should you deprioritize. So I think most of decisions are like that. Right, so you get enough to go in and say, okay, this makes sense. Let's do, and and move on. Right, so you don't need to be like, oh, I need to be this to be seven point three three four five six that level of accuracy. That's useless for this, right? Maybe in research project project in university may may, may make sense, right? But may not be for this. Yep. Yep. Oh, thank you. You have actually, uh, you have actually touched upon a couple of things that uh, I was going to ask next, but you already touched upon like, um, things that people should be aware when you're actually using data. Not going to a rabbit hole, but at the same time, we need to form clear hypothesis to test. Um, now I want to switch a little bit to retention. So, um, well, faith being, uh, you know, helping 
merchants to get, get cash back. Uh, so I'm very curious, what are the, some of the most effective marketing strategy that you have used in Faith that help with retention? Yeah, so I think for us is to help merchant to retain. And hence, if the merchant to retain, consumer would, would do it, right? So let's say for us, every Faith Pay transaction trigger a uh, cashback. Hmm. The only way to use cashback is you need to be retained to come back and hence you get the value of the cashback. Or else that cashback went disappeared, right? And there's a time bound. So it's a period of time, right? So let's say example for dent den den dentists that we work with. They want you to go back to do dentists every six months. It's very hard for them to do it. But let's say they put a 10% cashback. Now you do go to dentist, you paid 200 ringgit, you got a 10%, 20 ringgit. It expires at the end of six months. So in a way, it pushes you to do that dentist visits again within three months, uh, six months, right? Or the same thing, medical checkup. Or maybe the car workshop. Some of the car workshops are working with us, right? For you to service your car. Sometimes a lot of times, okay, we say, never mind, like, let's drag one more month, two more months. But if your car servicing is 800 ringgit, 5% cash is 40 ringgit. Service your car on time, you get 40 ringgit back. we auto deductor for your next car service, or you wait one more month and you lost that 40 ringgit. That drives people to go. So I think a lot of it is the objective driven and people do it subconsciously rather than saying that, okay, I need to be planned through, right? So it's a remind people, surface it out. Some people don't care, right? Oh, 40 more ringgit, yeah, servicing car, I don't care. But some people, a lot of people care. Most people care, right? So I think it's into, into driving that habit as well, right? So let's say like people with morning coffee, every morning you go back coffee, there are three, four coffee places. If this place keep on giving you the cash back, you're like, okay, this is my habit, right? I go and go back and do it. So, or some of them, they may be doing cashback and then they got, let's say, you know, like sometimes in malls, you have those people at a concourse area, they do events. Then you transact, you get a cashback. When a cashback, you have to go back to the, the store upstairs in the same mall, right? So that drives you back to the store, right? Or sometimes electronic shops, they do cashback. You buy the first thing, you buy the TVs. Let's say you buy the TV, 2,000 ringgit, 3% cashback, you got 60 ringgit. Then you have to go find something else to buy for 60 ringgit, right? Like if you don't find something 60 ringgit, now you buy 200 ringgit stuff, right? Kettles or whatever. So then 200 ringgit kettle, you get another 6 ringgit. Then you're like, okay, what can I buy? You buy two batteries or whatever, right? So people go through. And I have seen even very rich people do that. There was one Tan Sri that was managing billions of ringgits or sharing on how he buy one thing and get a cash pay and buy the second thing and then using cash pay buy the third thing. And this person managed billions, right? And this person still bothered to do that, right? And it became a fun factor, right? I know enough listed companies CEO in Malaysia that actually do that. When they meet me, they're like, see, I do this, I do that, right? So it's actually quite interesting, right? Sometimes you look at how, because people feel that the value, right? Let's say Penang. Penang, a lot of Penang nights, people are in a negative way, you say Kiam Siap. In a good way, is very cost conscious, right? So people really want to make sure that every dollar is captured and used, right? So for them is that I, if I can get this value, I get this value, right? So let's say stock value, the same thing, right? So I think we were talking about retention. And not just retention, but it's upselling at the same time of retention. So let's say you go to this coffee place. Decently enough, this coffee each time you pay about 10 ringgit. What we do is we actually work with a shop to, to let you top up maybe 40 ringgit. Uh, pay 40 for 50 ringgit top up to be used only in this cafe. So now you have actually paid 40 ringgit for your next few coffee there. If you don't go back in the next six months, that 40 ringgit will disappear. You have already prepaid, right? Today, in a, without a tool, Starbucks people will do it. But most other brands people won't do it. But now you enable the people to do it and say, okay, let me do it, right? Let me pay up front. And they don't even need to remember. They just need to, they can easily check. And they just when they pay, it's just auto deduct. They don't even remember and say, oh, do I still have that cashback? Do I still remember that, right? Don't have to. You just use it, right? And then you just auto deduct. So I think it's that sort of built a habit. So I think the as you go on retention, in the end, is understanding the consumer mindset. How do you be able to... What kind of behavior you want to drive back, right? Some may be daily behavior. Some may be weekly. Some may be monthly. Some six-monthly. 
uh, let's say dentist, you you don't want a, a a patient every two months come and see your dentist as well, right? I mean, something mm. quite wrong with you, right? So you just drive the right frequency. So a lot of it is use it in a right way. And anyway, say even reminding on retention, right? Different people have different preference. So let's say it's a push notification. For some people that use the app middle of night, pushing a notification to them at 12.30 a.m. is perfectly great. For a lot of people, that's annoyance, mm. right? For, let's say, emails. All our emails are actually automatically generated and it actually learns behavior. The more you open, the more email you get. So it actually learned the behavior with AIs and building through, right? And we've been doing it for the last many years without really calling it AI, right? Let's say, for example, every of the merchants, they actually get the reports, monthly reports of all their transactions, what time, what day people come, how where has gone up, how's the different outlets, how's the reviews at different outlets and everything. All these reports for all merchants, 30, 40,000 of them, are all generated AI, not done by human beings. It's auto-created and auto published for them, right? For them, for them to review. So it's actually quite interesting, right? If you look at this, is today a lot of things is actually already in that world. It's just that it was not branded as AI back then, right? To 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 think of it. It to back then it's just like okay like automated reporting, right? Yeah. But if you think on it, the slides are all written not by human already. And this world is going to come in, right? So if you think on it now today when you think of doing retention, how do you be able to drive it? And I think that as we talk about all this technology, there's still a huge leap to pull through the rest of the country or the rest of the world as well, right? There's, yes, in the major areas, a lot of these are default. People are on it. But there's still a lot of parts of the countries where people are still using cash. There's still a lot of parts of communities that people still don't believe or don't dare to try. So I think how do we move that needles across? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, what You inspire me to think about it as... Well, for example, certain times cashback or any other promotion tool, right? Everyone seems to know, yeah, I know about the tool, but actually to think deeper into, as a consumer, we are so easily, uh, we just take see the value and see the period, right? But what you inspire me is that actually there's a lot of thinking behind what value to put that makes sense so that people go through that funnel to keep on using the cashback and also the period that makes sense for the nature of the product. And just now you mentioned, um, but in order to do that, we need to understand the consumer mindset. Is there like any techniques that you can share with us on uh, techniques you use to understand consumer mindset or your team use? Hmm. So I think that the understanding consumer mindsets, I think one is that I think definitely data, right? Which area people repeat how frequently? Why people, like how often they repeat? They don't repeat. Do they spend more? Don't spend more? by demographics as well, right? Because let's say even if you do like retails, right? For sometimes, people that pay may not be people that are using it, right? So so even like maybe one example, right? Is like even a, for one of the women lingerie shops, most of the buy payers actually male. <laughs> yes. Right? So it's actually quite interesting, right? It, and it's actually by a certain segments and whatnot, right? So by age group and they're like, that's how that segment connect through as well, right? So, so I think it's using data give you a sense. So let's say example cashback. If your shops is already full at lunchtime, always lunchtime packed, no place to sit, don't give cashback at lunchtime. But mm. a lot of these shops, the same shop at 1, 30, 1 p.m. you have no seats. At 2.30 p.m. the shop is 90% empty. Why don't you do some cashback at 2.30 to bring some of the cost-conscious crowd and those have a little bit of flexi time that who will then eat their lunch later or earlier. Let's say you say like your, your peak crowd is 12 to 2. To drive it, you give decent amount of cash back after opti testing and optimize it, 11 to 2, 11 to 12, and 2 to 3. Then you basically now, instead of have a 2-hour full pack lunch crowd, now you have 4 hours of pack lunch crowd with the first hour and last hour has a bit more the rewards, right? The same thing, right? As 
flip the other way. Some places, their office area, weekends is empty. Right? The area has not much people. Or flip the other way, shopping malls that is crowded on weekends, weekday is empty. How do you drive that? Or even Ramadan. We all know in the industry that week two, week three of Ramadans is the time where people go out and eat buffet. The first three, four days and the last three, four days, usually people don't eat Ramadan buffet. Most of the time, people spend with families. So by knowing insights through data, you know how to price it. How do you move to certain segment to drive it, right? And sometimes also is demographics. Like let's say Aquarius or the KL Towers. Foreign tourists will go there. No question. They don't need any motivation. But for them to get it sustained, they might want local tourists. So then how do you target that? So a lot of it is also segmentized and understanding the numbers, right? So let's say example, for certain hotels, their buffet breakfast, like it or not, they are ready to serve. But today, because at a certain price range, people won't go. Is there a price range that you can do to drive more people to go in? Because after all, the food is there. There's a lot of sun cost, right? If you look at beauty wellness, the same thing. There's a lot of sun cost. Things has already opened. How do you drive it? Drinks has almost expiry. Food has almost expiry. How do you do it? Like I think traditionally people have been doing that, right? And at yep. what time? If you look at it, think of data in the airline industry or hotel industry, it has been there for quite some time. You know that every time you went to sit on a plane, the person left of you, right of you, paid maybe more than you or less than you. If you go to hotel, the person left of you, right of you, may pay more or less than you. It's not the same price across board. If you do right hailing, you book across three different people booking at the same time you might have different price based on certain behavior right let's say one of the common marketing things that people know many platforms do it if you use an iphone you are quite rich charge you more that's a typical right i think that a lot of e-commerce does that of course there's a level one basic fundamentals but it builds right i think that people go through today if you were looking at the airline price three times open close check close the best logic is increase the price slightly, you get panic, you buy straight away. Right? So there's a lot of those logics that has been done today to using data to maximize, optimize, and plow into the right right play, right? Yeah. Gotcha. And so we we talk a lot about um just now we talk about uh growing user base, we talk about retention. What are the key metrics you use to define success in marketing? from your perspective? Yeah, so I think for me is that a lot of time is that there is a input and maybe I will put it as an out, output, right? So I think if you think on it, what's the output? Output maybe is uh, installations or mm. what we call monthly active customers or new customers, paying people or maybe active users. So those are I would brand it as output, right? But then the input is at what point each of the funnels you build through, right? And I would say that for some of that, you pull the data, track it, and let it be. You don't look at it maybe every single day. At some of it, you go super deep. And in the end, is where is the problem, where you deep dive. And where is like you scan through, make sure nothing breaks. right? So I think that is, there's a lot of arts and science balancing between the two, right? In terms of, and because every business is very different as well. So I won't say it's a one-size-fits-all and say every business do have all these things. It doesn't work that way, right? So let's say example from web and app. Mm. For us, people that will buy a voucher is actually more cost-effective to sell them on the web. But after they set pay on the web, we will tell them that the only way to redeem is download the app. The cost to get this person to download the app is actually free now. Because people has paid for the voucher, the only way to do is download the app to use it. So there's no more cost to get it. Right, because they that's the only way to redeem it, right? So it is through some play, right? And that you have a sort of like understanding the nuances on it, right? So let's say think of even data back then. This was quite a few years ago, when in JB, right? We were looking at it like by some of the places the Singaporeans don't that doesn't use the transactions. And after what we found, the biggest problem they had is the place didn't offer a Wi-Fi they don't use because they have no internet. Mm -hmm. They don't have to pay a roaming. 
And that was a problem, right? And that can be an easier solve if we know it. So a lot of time is that why certain things that doesn't happen. Or maybe certain area now is better. Back then, certain LG floor, basement one, the internet doesn't work there. So people can't pay. I think this problem in this last two, three, four years, I think it's mostly soft. If you look at earlier years, then there's a lot of this problem, right? And I think things will evolve as we go along as well. All right, let's say back then when we were doing the KFIT business, right? The biggest acquisition segment was people that changed their relationship status on Facebook. Those days, people still change their status. Yeah. Single uh, in a relationship, in a relationship to engage. I mean, this day people I can remember bother. those days. <laughs> yeah. And that was our target audience. The moment you change, all the ads go there, right? Single to in a relationship. So now we say, you talk to them and say, okay, now you're in a relationship. So go and exercise together, have fun together. If you break up, then you'll say, okay, go out and have fun with new people. So the messaging can then tie to that. So in the end, we'll look at marketing, right? Is in this, are you talking to the people? We are all consumers as well, right? We are bombarded by unlimited marketing out there. So a lot of times, if you even as a marketer, right, ask yourself why you respond to certain things, why you don't respond to most of the things. For those that you respond yourself, why you respond? And a lot of them observe. If you put a point of sales material in front of the shops, videos stand there or around there and see how people react to those. Right? If you let's say you look at people's screen moving mouse screens or, or using their fingers in their phone. Like, where do they look at it? Where do they spend time? Where do they don't spend time? Where do they scroll through? Where do they give up? So I think a lot of nuances in there, right? In terms of that. So there'll be a, the objective part and the subjective part, right? And then you're going to tie to both. What is your view? How would generative AI uh, and the trend that we are seeing, how AI going into the mass market change marketing? Yeah, so I think that the today, I think what it would change certain things and it will not change certain things. You will start from mm. not changing, right? I think in the end, as you do marketing, you still need to talk to the audience. You still need to capture the buy-in from the audience, right? So the the audience, whether you want to do drive acquisition, people to download the app, people to sign up, register, people to pay for something. So that's acquisition, right? Or retention, people continue to come back. So I think that AI or data can drive that process a bit but what doesn't change is you still need to win over the customer, the consumer, right? Maybe the process steps is a bit easier, but the consumer still make the, that choice in one way or another, right? So whether it's one-off choice, then it's repeated, or it's a conscious choice along the way. But there's some choices to be made at a human being level. So I think that is still not changed. But I think what all this AI has evolved and transformed is that it enables us to understand people, right? So let's say today, you can basically train up all this generative AI, right? By basically saying that, okay, I have this demographics, these people are this behavior, this other, they reply with us this or whatnot. And how do we do it, right? If I want to have this rough messaging, what are the few drafts that we can do? What are the few images that we can be created within seconds, right? These are hours or days or weeks, right? So I think that it cut short a lot of it, it make us enable us to test, but it does not take away that it still need to win over the heart of consumer. So I think that's sort of where it is. And I think that today, in terms of if you look at a prompt engineering, learning how to write prompt, it's become super crucial, right? The yeah. same topic, same questions given to same five people asking slightly differently will get very different answer. And I think today that's the evolving, right? How do you be able to do it? And there'll be things that we get disrupted. There'll be things that will be enhanced. So I think as everyone looking into this is how do you be able to write this and then go beyond? Gotcha. And um, so that's my next question. If I were to ask you like uh, as a marketer, uh, what are the one to three things that you believe uh, at a marketer today should write on this wave in order to actually get ahead on it? instead of uh, the competitors actually getting ahead of it? Hmm, good question. I think as a marketer, I think one is that be very familiar with all the new tools. The, your competitors are going to have these tools. Your competitors are going to mm. use these tools, whether you like it or not. 
So I think it's be, be familiar, trial it, learn it, and really learn, unlearn, relearn, and to really optimize it, right? Exchange notes, don't be scared of it. Try it and find out what would work, right? I think in the end, knowing your end objective, leveraging it, right? Let's say you have a demographics or a segment, or you have uh, objection handling. All those with this stuff can be created, right? It can be reply, built on, and you train it up, right? So I think that you basically, I know of someone that was doing the SEO, right? And they were using this chat GPT to train up so that they can learn all the things, newer things, and then that got enhanced into their codes, right? So a lot of these things can be leveraged, right? So let's say example right now, if I think of, okay, I want to target this segment. Is it relevant segment or not? How big is the segment? What should I try to convince a skeptic of that segment? Right. So all this, you now have a easy tool within seconds or minutes, be able to create. And I think that there are more and more newer software as well, right? Newer tools that's built upon all these things as well, right? Let's say today you can create slides within seconds. You can do many, many things, right? Across board, right? Today, even with video, many of the videos are automatically generated, right? And you basically feel like similar, right? So I think that that will come in. So I think that if you think on it, one is embrace it, learn it, adapt to it, right? And build on. And I think the second one is that the still fundamentals are still key. No matter what the tools and everything, the fundamentals are still there. You can't get away without fundamentals. It's just that now with this, the, the way to approach the fundamentals may be slightly different, right? So think of the good old days, right? Back then, when the old, good old days are parent generations, they only had billboards, TV, and radio. Mm. In the last 10, 20 years, we have a flurry of online world that started created. And in between, there's maybe a bit of metaverse and whatnot start coming in into the picture. But if you think on it, it's just the medium that shifted, right? In a, if, a, if you're old enough, in a good old days chatting, you start from IRC, then ICQ, AOL, then MSN, Yahoo Messenger. Then you go on Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and all this thing, right? So, and then TikTok world, and now Lemonade, and all this thing, right? So the world shift with the tools and everything. But the fundamentals doesn't shift, right? People still need to communicate. The same thing in marketing. You still need to convince people to say, People, there's so think of it, there are multiple theories of marketing, right? But if you think on it, it's again, it's awareness, acceptance, and then after that, people go and activations, right? So I think in, in some form of that, it still need to go through that. There's people, do people aware of your things? After they're aware, do they know what you're doing? If they know what you're doing, do they think that that's relevant to them? Is it useful to them? And if it's passed through this phase, do they think that they should take the efforts to go in to get this? And then are they willing to pay for it? And if you think on it, it's roughly this, right? Irrespective of the medium. It's just the how you do it. Maybe the how you do it in each of the steps may be slightly different. But the fundamental doesn't change, right? Yeah. Do you answering some of those questions? And, and then if you go deeper on retention, the same thing, right? People are using whatever that you provide in whichever world, right? And after they use it, do they think they want to use it again? Do they feel good enough that they would repeat it? Would they want to continue paying for it? Would they want to get on a subscription where they pay every month continuously? Or would they want to pay ad hoc? Or maybe no, they're not going to do it anymore. Would they go out and tell, refer to others? And this is telling others also there are multiple things, right? One is saying that, okay, I just use it. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm just okay. The other one is, and you go and tell others, there are a few ways. One is that if you ask them to tell, and they would tell whether positive or negative. Or the other one is you don't even need them to tell and they will go and tell people everywhere and or go all out and go do it, right? So I think in the end is that that psychological, right? Why people do this? Why? So if you think on it, there are many of the things that people do it that it may not make sense logically, but people do it willingly. So how do you get to that mode that people will then refer your things, right? Go out there and tell people that, yeah, you should do this and encourage people, even though you don't incentivize them. 
right? And of course, there's also the forbidden fruit, right? Where people, when people don't do it, people will do it, right? So there is also that bragging rights and everything, right? And even now, it's across generations, right? So I think as you deal with your consumers or the target audience, there's also different segments. There's a segment that maybe many of you are familiar, the digital native, the people that grew up with technology. But as you go down this path, there are also many people that still feels a bit scared to use many things on digital work, right? So how do you win over that? Is that your segment or not your segment? If that's a segment, how do you convey to them? How do you give them confidence that they won't screw it up? You think of your parents, grandparents, uncles, and everything, right? How do you make them confident to do online banking? How do you make them confident to put in their credit card details? How do you make sure that they don't get scammed after that? Right, because the scammers are getting smarter as well, right? So Oh, yes. Have, they also have ChatGPT. Yes. They have everything. Right? So whatever you have, they have it. How do yes. you make sure that they... So it's a balancing as well, right? How do you pull someone in and yet give assurance, right? So if you think on it, there is multiple dimensions on that. Gotcha. I really like your examples to illustrate like how you pick a certain scenario and go narrow enough in order to find a talking point by using data. Um. So now we actually are going to wrap up. We're going into lightning round. I have three quick questions for you. Uh, so first question is, what advice would you give to someone um, who is interested in pursuing a career in marketing? Yeah, so I think that you care about, if you think on marketing, right, is that you care about getting people to get on something or get care about people to continue using something or care about people to tell others about something or care about people to spend more on something. I think it's the fundamentals of those few things, right? So you do you care deeply about this or not? The methods and style will change. Today, maybe it's this medium. Five years later, it will be different mediums. Ten years later, it will be different. There will be different segments. Do you care about different segments? All these details, right? And it's a balancing between data, creativity, and testing. It's a, you need all three at different blend right full data alone no observation doesn't work all observations have no data like it can't work as well and if you have all this data and everything but you're not creatively talking to people it doesn't work empathy people care about it where people know that you care about them so i think that's maybe that right so i think that will be sort of how i look at it, yeah nice uh question number two what is the one marketing book or resources that you would recommend hmm so the, I think, good question, right? So I think for me, these days, I think instead of reading books, I think it's a lot of the articles and everything. But I think that now I would actually recommend BART, B-A-R-D, BART.google.com. Yeah. Anything that you have in mind and thoughts, just go and talk to BART. I, mean, I spend quite a lot of time talking to BART these days, asking that BART to do everything for me, right? And when a company announced their quarterly earnings, analyze for me. When the exchange rate in, uh, goes up, goes down, as about what happened. US debt ceiling, but just a summary for me every day and tell me what happens, why not, right? Why this person say so? Why this person do that? So I'm talking to but every day, right? So I think that the, and if you think of any marketing things, you can go on that, right? And pick it up through the, I mean, that's just one, but I think is go out there and pick the medium that you learn the best. It could be video. It could be audio. It could be reading. It could be through talking. It could be through short form, long form, and all different ways. It could be through trial error. could be through instruction, formal formal instruction. No wrong, wrong. Pick the way that you learn best and go on it. Um, so for our listeners who want to follow and connect with you, what's the best way to do so? Yeah, so I think feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. I think that's uh, best. Of course, don't sell me things. I know that I'm in a marketing data related sessions, but I do get a lot of spam message and people try to sell, so don't sell me. If you sell, try to sell to me, I'm not going to re respond on it. So I think that's maybe one, right? And I think that the, and I think even if you try to sell something to anyone, you like be contextual, right? And find a way to relate because all else is just spam, right? So I yeah. think that the, the, so I think that's maybe the best way to reach out 
And of course, if you are in KL or whatnot, I think there are a lot of events and whatnot. Sometimes I'm there. So feel free to say hi and whatnot. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and we will use the lessons that you tell, you know, using data to understand you, to talk to you instead of just selling to you. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Chen Chao. Thank you so much for listening. If you find this valuable, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. Also, please consider giving us a rating or leaving us a review because this really can help other listeners to find the podcast. You can find all the episodes or learn more about this podcast at was.ai. See you in the next episode.